Hi, and welcome back to the Why Mayo podcast. This is Janine Steen, your host, hoping to answer your questions about the who, what, where, when, why, and how when it comes to myofunctional therapy. During my last two podcasts, I've spoken about both anterior and posterior tongue ties, some of the symptoms that we see associated um, with each of them, um, some of the things that you can look for, um, and some of the um, ways you can advocate for your patient or your child if you are noticing certain symptoms or having certain concerns. One thing that when we identify an anterior or posterior tongue tie during an evaluation or even during subsequent therapy sessions, we do typically make a referral um, or recommendation to have an assessment of that frenum, whether it be anterior or posterior. When we make that recommendation, um, and I know I've spoken about this in the past, um, we typically like to explain to that practitioner what our concerns are. Um, As it's not always um, assessed for a speech pathologist um, reasons or not necessarily looked at considering what our goals are or not always looked at um, when it comes ha- relating to swallowing or not always looked at as it relates to the palate or not always looked at as it relates to the dentition. So it is important to when you're making that recommendation or even as a parent or practitioner speaking to another practitioner about the frenum um, and your concerns regarding that lingual frenum, uh, posterior or anterior lingual frenums, um, to explain what your concerns are. With an anterior tongue tie, it could be that you're concerned about their production of sounds, their ability to um, lack their failure to thrive, their digestive issues, whereas with the posterior tongue tie, you might be concerned about um, the shape of the palate, the um, production of, again, certain sounds, um, the um, impact of their tongue thrust and the inability to correct that tongue thrust because um, of that restricted palate. And even um, going back to some of those sensory um, and feeding issues that can occur um, secondary to a posterior tongue tie as well. When we make the recommendation, we always um, make the recommendation for a laser phrenectomy um, and not a traditional cutting of the frenum. Um, And that's only based on preference and the success that we have seen um, with one versus the other. When you're using the um, CO2 laser or doing a laser versus a traditional um, cutting of the frenum, there is definitely less scarring, there is less bleeding, um, the recovery is a lot quicker, um, and they are typically um, practicing and doing exercises pretty quickly and back in therapy pretty quickly as well. Um, Actually, it is extremely important that post phrenectomy, whether um, traditional or otherwise, that the patient and or the parent are hyper vigilant when it comes to completing the exercises given to them or consulting with a therapist who is monitoring and watching over them as they do these exercises. The exercises are designed to improve range of motion but also to limit the amount of scar tissue. So it is not uncommon for a patient to have a phrenectomy not be great about practicing um, the stretching exercises provided or not being, um, I don't want to say strict enough or not being able to, um, being cautious 
when doing those exercises and not really pushing the patient or pushing their child um, and thus causing scar tissue to develop, which often requires a redo of that phrenectomy in the future. Um, that scar tissue that develops is essentially as if the frenum reattached. Um, and now we are maybe not all the way back to square one, but we're close to it. In some cases, um, we'll make the recommendation for a phrenectomy and um, the practitioner will agree that a phrenectomy is necessary. However, or a phrenectomy would be beneficial um, and a parent may not be willing to move forward with that phrenectomy. Um, and of course, that is their prerogative and their decision However, it does mean or and it will mean that um, a patient may not be able to participate in a myofunctional therapy program um, or if it is a patient that is unable to participate in a myofunctional therapy program, um, it does mean then instead of treating the cause of this patient's problem, we are only addressing the symptoms. And um, when we are addressing the symptoms, that is typically oral motor therapy um, or articulation therapy, and that is not true myofunctional therapy. When we're doing myofunctional therapy, we are working on the cause of the problem, and if it has to do with their shortened frenum that is causing or um, exacerbating their tongue thrust, if we don't address the frenum, then there's no way for us to address the foundation of the issue of their tongue thrust. So we may be able to work on some of the symptoms. Um, however, when you're working on symptoms, there's no crystal ball to tell us if, if we treat all the symptoms separately, will the end result be the remediation of their tongue thrust? There's just no way to know. Um, in our experience or in my experience, it is typically not always successful. Um, and I would say the majority of the time it is not successful um, because often it takes so much time for the patient to habituate these new techniques and new strategies um, on a very structured level, but then um, when it comes to carryover and generalization, um, it just never happens or it so takes such a long time that the patient loses interest or discontinues um, unsuccessfully. And that's the last thing that we want. But we do always respect not just the recommendations of the practitioner, um, but also the um, concerns of a parent. As a myofunctional therapist and a speech language pathologist. Um, it is my job to continue to educate the parent about why we're making these recommendations, um, what my concerns are, um, and also to be honest about if we don't do this, such, if we don't do a phrenectomy, then it means that we're going to treat the symptoms. And if we're treating just the symptoms, then I can't say with certainty as I could with a patient that's doing the myofunctional therapy program that they will successfully remediate their tongue thrust. All of these things take time. Um, and when you are working on changing a pattern that happens every one to two minutes, which would be our swallow pattern, if anything is impeding that swallow from happening correctly, then there is less of a chance that of that long-term success. We want to take all of those impeding characteristics or those impeding factors out of the way so that we can make our patient um, and put them, set them up for success. We always say we need the maximum amount of space and range of motion um, within the oral cavity in order to create the most optimal situation for our patient um, when it comes to being successful in therapy as a whole, but also when it comes to myofunctional therapy. Parents and patients are often nervous and concerned about what 
it means to have a lingual phrenectomy, uh, especially when you tell them they're going to um, sever this piece of skin under the tongue. And um, I've had the luxury of watching a few of them, um, maybe more than a few at this point. I've watched a, a bunch of them and um, it takes longer to set up for the procedure of a laser phrenectomy than the procedure takes to complete. Most of the time, if it's a young child um, or an infant, um, the practitioner, I've watched um, an oral surgeon complete these. Um, Dr. Scott Siegel, who is just amazing um, with all ages and um, and all areas when it comes to frenums, whether it be lingual, anterior, posterior, labial, um, buccal, any tethered tissue, I tend to rely on Dr. Siegel's um, advice and, and input, but also his expertise when it comes to um, completing the phrenectomy. So um, typically he will have the parent, the child, infant um, sit on the parent's lap. Um, an infant may be in their car seat, so they're really restricted. Um, and he will just do use a little numbing agent and away he goes um, at lasering and releasing that tie. There is very, very little blood. There is some discomfort but um it is minimal and um there's very little restrictions that the child has when it comes to um, eating or returning to school or a patient returning to work uh it's a quick and speedy recovery um again it is always important for the doctor to um provide a list of exercises um, i definitely think and would recommend that um, these exercises be done with the guidance of a myofunctional therapist or speech pathologist so that you can be assessing and making recommendations whether a parent or the patient is not um, stretching enough or being too um, careful or is are being too rough but also so that we can check in and make sure that everything um, is healing the way it should. Um, the doctor will also have follow-up visits so that they can, whether it be virtual or in person, to assess um, that the freedom is healing well um, and also assess um, any reattachment or assess the um, impact of scar tissue. When it comes to having these procedures, um, sometimes um, we have seen that they are covered um, by dental insurance. Um, in other cases, we haven't. I think a lot has to do with not just um, what that practi practitioner doing the phrenectomy accepts, um, but also the limitations of that patient's dental um, or medical plan. Um, in my experience, it usually falls under their dental plan, not their medical plan. Um, however, if a there are times where an ear, nose, and throat will perform, an ENT will perform um, phrenectomies, and in that situation, it could be, I'm not sure, covered by medical. Um, but in my experience, it's typically pediatric dentists and oral surgeons, um, thus falling under that um, dental health and dental medicine. Sadly and unfortunately, dental health coverage is not always great for the majority of individuals um, and most times there is um, an out-of-pocket expense associated with having a phrenectomy. Um, however, the long-term benefits and gains that um, and the savings for a patient or a parent after a phrenectomy is conducted, especially the earlier it's conducted, um, as if we can release a posterior tongue tie and train and condition um, the child to keep their tongue where it needs to in their hard palate 
while that may limit or eliminate the need for palate expansion, um, which is an expense, um, it can change or limit the orthodontic plan, which again would be an expense. Um, it may change or limit the need for um, speech therapy or swallowing therapy, um, TMJ therapy. So all of those expenses should be taken into consideration when making that initial um, decision whether to spend the money to have um, our lingual phrenectomy completed. I hope I was able to give you some insight and answer some of your questions regarding myofunctional therapy. Please stay tuned and listen to our Myo Minute and tune in to our Talk the Talk interviews with the many different medical, dental, and rehab professionals as they elaborate or answer your questions and address your concerns directly, especially when it's related to speech language pathology and myofunctional therapy.